it would be very nice to have a way of treating an infection that did not immediately elicit an evolutionary response by the pathogen, either in terms of resistance or virulence or any other thing the pathogen might do. So let's take a look at some ideas for ways of treating patients, therapies that are evolution proof. The reasons for this is that uh, the first is that antibiotic resistance evolves rapidly and we're running out of drugs. We can slow the emergence of resistance by using moderate doses and targeting old age classes of pathogens. This is plausible, but it's controversial. It's hard to decide I'm not going to hammer it as hard as possible. Okay. Secondly, we could try phage therapy. That is, we could use viruses that are specialized on killing bacteria rather than antibiotic drugs to kill the bacteria. They multiply in proportion to their bacterial hosts, and they also co-evolve with their bacterial hosts. This has been tested, and it works. Third, we can disrupt bacterial communication. Uh, we can do that by introducing cheaters that don't bear the cost of signal production or that are susceptible to antibiotics. This is plausible, but it's very early days. It hasn't really been tested yet. Let's take a look at all three. The first idea is don't wipe out the competition. Don't use any more selection than absolutely necessary to cure the patient. What's going on when we apply large doses of antibiotics to patients is that we're creating selection pressure that makes it very advantageous to be resistant. And we are wiping out the non-resistant bacteria. Now, normally, the non-resistant bacteria would be competing with the resistant ones. In fact, probably out-competing them. So we are essentially creating a situation where we're wiping out the competition. If we don't use that much antibiotic, then we're preserving clones of less virulent pathogens. These can compete with the more virulent ones, and we can slow down the evolution of resistance. There's an assumption here, and that is that the more resistant a pathogen is, the more virulent it is. It is certainly more virulent in the presence of the antibiotic. You can go take a look at this issue with Andrew Reed's TED Med talk, which you can find at this location. Andrew gives a great talk, and he's very passionate about this. A second strategy is to use phage, which are viruses that attack bacteria. Here's a picture of a phage. They've got some advantages. One is that they multiply exponentially just the way bacteria do. That means you can give a small initial dose once, and the phage will multiply as the infected the bacteria. That means you don't have to give them many times. Of course, that's not very economically interesting to big pharma, but it's very interesting to the patient. Phage also mutate during replication, as do bacteria, and they produce new phage that can recognize altered bacteria. We've seen that bacteria are shapeshifters, but the phage can keep up with them. Unlike a traditional antibiotic, which kill useful bacteria, that help us digest food and produce vitamins, phage target specific bacteria. They're magic bullets, okay? And that reduces the chance that the useful bacteria will be killed. In other words, with phage therapy, it's unlikely that debilitating diarrhea would result from taking a course of therapeutic whatever. That often happens with antibiotics. Here's the history of phage therapy. Phage were first discovered about 1915, and by 1928, a Frenchman had already tried phage therapy. You can pull this up and look at it in more detail. The basic idea here is that in uh, both labs in, in the West, but also in clinics in Russia and Poland, phage therapy started to be used. About the 1940s, there was an eclipse. That's when antibiotics came along. Penicillin became popular. Then the other antibiotics came in. And uh, at that point, people more or less started to neglect phage therapy and concentrated on drugs instead. However, they continued to be used in Eastern Europe. 
So the question is, is it safe? Can you really put a virus into a human body and have it only attack bacteria? And can it compete economically with drugs? It's a lot cheaper to produce phage than it is to produce some drug. So while the US and other Western countries invested in antibiotics, Russians developed phage. Mouse studies have shown that phage can be just as effective as antibiotics. Clinical studies are still controversial in the United States. There's quite a debate over this. However, phage were recently approved to protect humans from beef that have been contaminated with E. coli. As you know, E. coli can get into the food chain, and it can then cause some very serious infections in humans. And this has actually been approved by the FDA now. So in Russia, it was used in the Second World War to treat field wounds and cholera. And in the US, it is used to disinfect meat. Here is an example of a recent trial. It was done with Clostridium difficile. It's a major cause of hospital-acquired diarrhea. And it, phage were used because Clostridium has evolved multiple drug resistance, so the drugs weren't working. A phage was tested in a human colon model system. So this isn't the real live human colon. This is a model of a human colon. It significantly reduced the size of the bacterial population, and it significantly reduced the concentration of the bacterial toxins that cause the, bac the uh, diarrhea. There weren't any detectable detrimental effects on any commensal bacteria living in the system. So it did seem to be pretty specific, OK? Now, there are some pros and cons in phage therapy. The pros are they kill the bacteria, they adjust dosing, they're not toxic, they don't disrupt commensals, there's no resistance evolution. You can discover them quickly, apply them flexibly, and so forth. Low cost. The cons are that if you have a non-lytic phage, it's inappropriate. The narrow host range is sometimes disadvantageous. The phage can evolve, so they're live. Well, they're, quote, live. They are, a, they are an evolving system inside the host body. They interact with the immune system. And live attenuated vaccines do the same, OK? So there are certainly some cons. Another place where we can apply viral therapy is in attacking cancers. So here we have a picture of a group of, of cells. The blue ones are normal. The orange ones are cancer cells. We inoculate with phage that has been engineered to specifically attack the cancer cells. And eventually, the dead cells here are here indicated by gray. The cancer dies. So this is a case where non-pathogenic viruses are being developed to find and to destroy tumors. One nice thing about this is viruses have none of the side effects of chemotherapy. They are not going to cause hair to fall out and the intestinal lining to slough off. Mouse studies of this kind of system are quite promising. And VSV is a candidate virus for use in human anti-cancer therapy. This is what it looks like. And the particular part of the VSV molecule or the coat that's being modified is this M unit right here. The third major strategy for producing evolution-proof therapy is to try to manipulate the social evolution of bacteria. Bacteria communicate with each other. They produce signaling molecules. And the reason they do that is they aren't going to attack the host until they get a signal that a certain threshold density has been attained. In other words, the bacteria wait until they're sure that there are a lot of colleagues present to try to attack. A, if only a few bacteria attack a host, it's quite probable they'll all be killed by the immune system. But if they go in en masse, then they have a good chance of establishing a beachhead. That's why these communication systems are set up. If these signals are disrupted, it might be difficult to re-evolve them because of costs imposed by cheats. What do we mean by a cheat? A cheat is a bacterium that doesn't make the signal. 
And what that does, essentially, is it creates a condition where it will be hard for the signal-making bacteria to, to reinvade a population composed mostly of cheaters. This is essentially exploiting the evolution of bacterial social behavior. You can make the resistant or pathogenic bacteria compete with several different kinds of cheats. Cheats that don't produce public goods, that is, these signals. Cheats that carry a medically beneficial allele, that's a Trojan, a Trojan horse cheat. That would be a cheat that could invade, that was going to outcompete the pathogenic bacterium, but that was then susceptible to a particular antibiotic. So this is a way of getting antibiotics back in the game. Or you could have a cheat that carries an allelopathic trait. So it could be either an anti-competitor molecule, a bacteriosin that's produced by that cheat, or it could be carrying a phage. In other words, it could be carrying a weapon in that would then come out of hiding, explode, and eliminate bacteria. Here is one example. You could start with a natural population where W, these are mice, and W is indicating that it's infected by the wild type bacterium, and C are a few mice that have the cheat in it. And in the, in the natural population, the wild type increases, and the cheat is eliminated. In the manipulated population, what you're doing is you're reducing the virulence of bacterial infection, okay? And what's happening here is that the cheats are increasing in frequency in the next mouse generation. More of them are infecting the population because of some, infect, uh, some manipulation which is done by the experimenter. And if that cheat happens to be susceptible, say, to antibiotics, at this point, antibiotic therapy would suddenly become fairly useful. That is laid out in a bit more detail here. You can have infected hosts that are infected with wild type. You can inoculate them with cheaters. And when you then, that are carrying uh, genes that make them susceptible to antibiotics, and then when you treat with antibiotics here, you wipe out the infection. So these sorts of scenarios are theoretically interesting and they are being played out in laboratory experiments at this point, but thus far they have not advanced to the stage of saying, yes, we really have a workable therapy. So this third type where there's manipulation of bacterial signaling and introduction of bacterial cheaters into populations is very much in an early developmental stage. So to summarize, Pathogens rapidly evolve resistance to drugs, and that has motivated people to look for ways of curing infections that do not elicit this kind of evolutionary response. Evolution can be slowed down by not treating too intensely. Phage therapy is quite promising. It's been used in Eastern Europe. It's more controversial in the West. Disrupting bacterial communication and social coordination is quite intriguing in theory, but it has yet to be demonstrated in practice.